Hello, and welcome back. I'm Jeff Seaman, and I'm a board member of the Scleroderma Research Foundation. I became passionate about scleroderma four years ago when my daughter was diagnosed with systemic scleroderma. Before introducing our next session, Juvenile Onset Systemic Scleroderma, what it is and how is it evaluated and treated. Now, I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Catherine Tork. She is the director of the Pediatric Scleroderma Clinic at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. She juggles seeing patients in the clinic, conducting her own research to help develop more effective therapies for localized and systemic scleroderma in children, and mentoring the next generation of pediatric rheumatologists at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Dr. Torek is the principal investigator of the National Registry of Childhood Onset Scleroderma, NRCOS, in which she collects standardized clinical assessments alongside blood and skin biopsies from childhood onset scleroderma patients. This registry has grown to be a rich and valuable resource that Dr. Tork and her collaborators use to investigate the causes and manifestations of scleroderma in kids, as well as potential new therapies for childhood onset scleroderma. And now I'll hand this over to Dr. Tork. Thank you, Jeff, for that kind introduction. Um, you might recognize someone on this slide. Um, this, this is Dr. Catherine Torak here from University of Pittsburgh, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, um, giving a talk here with the Scleroderma Research Foundation about juvenile onset systemic scleroderma, what it is, and how it's evaluated in treatment and treated. For this 20-minute uh, talk, we're going to talk about what scleroderma means in children, how the onset and evaluation is slightly different in children compared to adults, and just a general overview of our treatment approach as pediatric rheumatologists. So what is scleroderma? Scleroderma is Greek for hard skin, scleros, hard skin, derma. Um, this is an autoimmune disease where for some reason your immune system really kicks up and starts attacking your own internal organs um, and skin and vasculature. Um, we're going to talk today specifically about pediatric systemic sclerosis or systemic scleroderma. We're going to change, we're going to save localized scleroderma or morphia for another talk. Um, these are distinct, um, different diseases or they do share similar, um, pathology of the skin. But again, we'll, we'll talk about just systemic sclerosis in this, um, talk right now. So who gets scleroderma in, um, all of systemic sclerosis, only 5% are childhood onset. So if you kind of look at the numbers and uh, uh, calculate things out, this is three per 1 million children in the United States. Um, if you look at how many kids are in the United States, this whittles down to about 250 kids in the US. So it's quite rare, but we're here to help. Um, that's what the Scleroderma Research Foundation and um, centers like my, my own at University of Pittsburgh, we're here for you. Um, the kids, when they get it, um, the average age of onset is around seven to nine years old, um, a little bit more females to males, and no racial prevalence. We see this across different ethnicity and races. Um, the diagnosis is often delayed since it is pretty rare. It usually takes about one to at least two years to get the final diagnosis and get to the pediatric rheumatologist. Um, this is a little different in contrast to the adult um, onset of scleroderma, which is around 40 years old. So we're not going to go into much detail, but this is just a cute cartoon showing that the immune system kind of turns on itself. Um, and instead of recognizing viruses and bacteria as foreign, it's also recognizing your own cells and um, proteins and parts of your um, organs as foreign. So that's why it's attacking them. So it specifically leads um, a kind of inflammation in the organs. Um, and then that inflammation then drives fibrosis or the thickness that you'll notice on the skin and the organs such as the lungs and also cause blood vessel problems, which leads to Raynaud's and those digital tip ulcers that you'll see. So this is just a demonstration of that early in the disease, that inflammation uh, causes um, extra cells in the dermis or the skin that shouldn't be there. It starts to cause some swelling and puffiness of the fingers. That's when it will look like sclerodactyly. Also puffiness in the feet are demonstrated on this teenage female. And then later, the collagen starts really um, depositing, causing that thick skin and trouble kind of bending the fingers, um, et cetera, which is kind of demonstrated in the lower panel of a pediatric onset scleroderma patient. So how do we diagnose pediatric scleroderma? This is really um, up to kind of clues in the history and physical exam um, with the rheumatologist. Um, some things are very obvious um, and some findings are kind of more subtle and you have to look for them. 
it's kind of putting these together. There's no one single lab test um, that will that will kind of diagnose scleroderma, but there's definitely supporting antibodies and things of that nature. Um, imaging and other evaluation definitely help as well. So what problems specifically affect juvenile um, scleroderma patients? So as in adults, the vast majority, 90% or so, do have the skin involvement, such as the skin thickening and vascular involvement, like the Raynaud's phenomenon and the digital ulcers. For kids, the lung involvement, meaning that interstitial lung disease, that inflammation and that turns to fibrosis in the lungs, actually happens just as often as adults. This is around 40%. And we actually just published this um, a little about two years ago in our international cohort. Before that, it was thought to maybe be 15 to 20%. But now we know with the high resolution CT of the chest that the interstitial lung disease is more prevalent in children than once thought. Um, I also want to mention um, gastrointestinal disease. This is kind of overlooked in kids. A lot of the times the kids just aren't growing on the growth curve or kind of stagnant and not get, gaining weight when they actually should be um, gaining weight and uh, height during this time of uh, critical time in development. They might not just have overt symptoms of um, gastroesophageal reflux, like they might not have that heartburn symptom. I also want to mention musculoskeletal. In pediatric scleroderma, there's much more what we call overlap disease, meaning lots of features that overlap with a condition called dermatomyositis or inflammation of the muscle skin. Um, so a lot of uh, juvenile onset scleroderma patients actually have muscle involvement. And this causes weakness um, of the muscles. It can cause some cardiac issues. And it also can cause weakness of the diaphragm or the lung muscles. And that can actually cause some lung issues as well. So I just wanted to highlight that briefly. Um, and really, kids don't complain. You, The rheumatologist or physicians have to be really savvy and uh, ask the questions a certain way. Basically, what happens is the kids just kind of stop doing sports. Like they'll stop doing something that's more um, really active, like football or basketball. Then they'll kind of stop doing tennis, and then they'll stop doing swimming. So they kind of pull away slowly from their sports. So you really have to um, probe and, and figure out what's been going on and for how long. This is just some pictures of some of my patients with juvenile systemic sclerosis. Um, some of the facial facial features like the tight small lip like you would see in adults, but sometimes it's just more subtle. Um, some of the finger changes or the kind of uh, joint contractures, um, the interstitial lung disease with the fluffy infiltrates in the lung throughout the lung field, uh, digital tip ulcers, and then kind of skin thickness of the young uh, gentleman's um, chest wall, almost like a shield. I also wanted to bring uh, to your attention the growth chart. You can see in a pediatrician's office, when you review that with them, the child's growth should be going in the same percentile, like 10th, 25th, 50th. But when it starts dropping, you know, like this young um, lady, it was like 25th percentile, then 10th percentile, then below the growth curve. That's a sign that they're not absorbing the nutrients they need to and something um, systemically is going on. And that is pretty common for uh, pediatric onset scleroderma which is a little different than adults because adults don't have growth curves. Um, they're already grown. So these are some skin changes, um, again, in some of my patients with scleroderma. There's sclerodactyly, the thickened skin, um, telling dictagias, um, the decreased oral aperture that you can see in the lower pictures. Um, and then they actually uh, get a lot of hyper or hypopigmentation, and especially in the darker skin patients. Um, they're, they can be kind of medium color, and then they get this um, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation that's quite dark, and, and it bothers them too. Other skin changes um, are calcinosis or calcinosis cutis, also seen in adult scleroderma. Um, this tends to be on pressure points, like extensor surfaces, like the elbow or the top of the knuckles that are hit over and over again. We do see this more in our pediatric patients that have that myositis overlap or muscle disease. Um, and then also other skin changes, we see a global thinning or atrophy. You know, some of the parents will notice that their child looks more veiny in general. That's because the subcutis or the fat layer starts to decrease as well. Um, and then there's ulcerations either from the, the contact on the extensor surface or from the, on the fingertips from the Raynaud's phenomenon. Other vascular problems um, encountered are like adults where Raynaud's is quite common, at least 90%, and that's the triphasic color change of the blue, white, and red, um, can be uh, brought on by cold or stress. 
Um, these are photos of um, patients with Raynaud's phenomenon. You can see the well-demarcated white line on some of them. Um, and then this will, over time, lead to those digital ulcers. I wanted to bring up the nail fold capillary changes. That's when the doctor is looking with a dermatoscope. I have a picture, I believe, next um, at those little tiny vessels at the tips of the fingers. Um, that's what we're looking to see if they're abnormal. That's our little window into what the vessels look like. Ah, there we go. So the, the dermatoscope, this is what it looks like. If you see a pediatric rheumatologist, odds are that they have this and they're looking at your child's finger. Um, but these are actually the, the blown up pictures of what we're looking for. The nail fold capillaries do help tell us, hey, is disease really active? Um, is there just kind of more damage or quiet changes? They get the vessels get very dilated. They start to what, what's called hemorrhage and get little like hemorrhage spots. Um, but then later, you kind of have a loss of the nail fold capillary, so you have less in a row. So this is what we're looking at when we use this dermatoscope. Other evaluation that we um, like to do is looking at the lungs, seeing what's going on. Is there interstitial lung disease? Is there pulmonary arterial hypertension? Luckily, in, in pediatric onset, the pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is that high pressure in the vessels, like coming out of the heart towards the lungs, Luckily, that's decreased um, in, in frequency in kids, so only um, two, about 2 to 5% in children. Um, and then sometimes it's related to interstitial lung disease as well. How we screen for this is usually the echocardiogram. It's actually pretty helpful in, in children. Um, and then another thing we look at on the pulmonary function test, specifically there's a, this thing called the DLCO, that's diffuse um, exchange of the carbon monoxide. Um, if that's low and the other PFTs are normal, that might be a clue that there's pulmonary hypertension going on. If we think something's really happening there, then the child may get a right heart catheterization, but since that's pretty invasive, we only um, kind of get that involved if some of these other things are abnormal. We also look for interstitial lung disease um, by now recommending that every new onset um, juvenile systemic scleroderma patient gets a high resolution CT of their chest. This was not standard of care because we were at first worried about the radiation, um, but then over time, the CT scanners have had less radiation and we've noticed that the chest X-ray really and the pulmonary function tests together really miss a large amount of um, interstitial lung disease in these children's when we, children when we did the study. So we definitely recommend a baseline high resolution chest CT for all the patients. Um, and then follow-up will just depend if there's findings or not. Um, we also recommend the pulmonary function test when the child is breathing into the tube and you're looking at the, um, the functional vital capacity, the total lung capacity, and that DLCO or gas exchange that I mentioned. And this is what it looks like. We do like them to do the three different phases. Um, the one that you're like sitting in the box is um, the, you know, a little more intense, but we do um, like that to get the true lung volumes. Um, that's the plasmography and then also the spirometry and then the DLCO is that oxygen exchange. So little kids can do it, but they definitely need to be with respiratory therapists that are kind of um, skilled in this and have experience to kind of coach the kids through this. Um, it's really helpful for muscle weakness as well, in addition to screening for that interstitial lung disease and monitoring the patients. Um, luckily, the cardiac issues are, are pretty infrequent in pediatric scleroderma, thank goodness, um, but when it's present, it is associated with muscle disease. If they have a high burden of muscle disease, like in their regular muscles, like their quads and their, you know, their biceps, things like that, that is sometimes associated with heart muscle disease, and when that happens, that's sometimes inflammation leads to fibrosis, and that fibrosis makes those electrical pathways kind of uh, problematic for the heart, and that's when it causes some of those arrhythmias. Um, so how do we screen for that? We do recommend an EKG, that's the, echo, uh, the um, electrocardiogram, those little leads, and just once a year at least, just routine screening if there's abnormal abnormalities on the EKG, or the patient feels like there's heart flutters or something like that, we would recommend a halter monitor, which is just kind of wearing those leads, but for a couple days. And then the cardiologist downloads that and looks at the, that, EK, that long EKG. Um, we do also recommend a baseline echocardiogram to see if there's any heart pump um, abnormalities, and that's annual is what we usually recommend. The cardiac MRI is only if we're seeing some abnormal or abnormalities on those other measures. Um, so that is done in pediatrics. It's just not um, a routine screening thing that we would do. 
um, GI issues, I wanted to bring this to attention because Really, kids don't complain. Um, it's not until we did a study um, at our center using um, the GIT, which is a, a GI-specific systemic scleroderma developed um, quality of life measure, and we really found that kids do have these issues. We just need to ask them um, in a certain way, um, and they won't complain of that reflux, that chest burning, but they will say, oh, they get full after eating a small amount. Um, sometimes, you know, they'll Kind of cough at night so they're having a lot of, G of esophageal dysmotility um, and then they can have aspiration like adults can too when you're just not moving that esophagus and then you lay down and then it kind of creeps up and unfortunately um, by accident can go down the windpipe um, so all the things that happen in adult can happen in kids as well and it's recognized more and more that this is um, pretty much as frequent as adults um, and in kids what I mentioned before is just really pay attention to their body mass index. Are they falling off the growth curve? Is there issues with failure to thrive? That would potentially indicate that they have GI disease. Um, and then the baseline evaluations that we would recommend would be fluoroscopy of the esophagus. That's kind of, they swallow the contrast. There's a picture here. Um, and this young uh, lady, actually a teenager, she had a, um, reflux that she didn't even have symptoms but on testing you could see the to and fro of the contrast and over time that actually developed like a stricture called a, a shatsky ring um, from that recurrent um, acid kind of eroding into the esophagus so we do recommend these screening studies even if they don't have symptoms um, and then the gastric emptying study to see how long it takes the stomach to empty out if these two things are delayed sometimes we recommend promotility agents that help the gut to move things along um, and then if they seem like they're having choking, gagging, um, then they might have some of that aspiration and we'd recommend a swallow study with speech pathology. There's some more invasive testing. Um, it is important though, if, if like significant GI disease is kind of thought to be going on or needs to be evaluated, that's the pH probe where they get the probe down their nose and measures the amount of acid, how high the acid goes, how long, if the patients are having symptoms for 24 hours, along with the manometry of the esophagus, which measures the pressure of the esophagus, like how much dysfunction is there um, of that esophagus to help move food through there. Um, and why this is important, because um, kind of a floppy esophagus, for better words, um, that doesn't have much muscular tone and is dysfunctional, can increase your risk of having that aspiration and um, into the lungs and causing some lung issues. So that's why it's so important. And then musculoskeletal problems I didn't want to um, leave out. As I mentioned, this is pretty prevalent in children, 30 to 50%, which is much higher than originally thought. Um, they can have arthritis or joint pain or tendonitis or inflammation of the tendon. Um, but most times they actually have some kind of myositis or muscle inflammation with muscle weakness. When you do the formal muscle testing, it's hard for them to get off of the floor, um, use their proximal muscles and their their hip girdle muscles and their core body muscles most of the time. I'm showing some of these MRIs to show you that the muscle should just be like a bland gray. And it's kind of like this bright white showing edema or inflammation throughout several muscle groups um, in a patient that it was not known that um, she had muscle involvement. These are more seen commonly seen when we do some of the antibody testing in patients with these muscle antibodies like PMSEL, U3 RMP, or overlap antibody U1 RMP. Again, those with those dermatomyositis-like features tend to have more of these findings. So evaluation is a good muscle exam. Um, check the muscle enzymes in the blood, but really a baseline hip girdle of the MRI um, is, I'm sorry, hip girdle MRI is, is really helpful in children and you don't even need contrast. And there's no radiation to an MRI. So don't forget the generalized symptoms like kids definitely have fatigue, malaise, you know, weight loss, just getting out of bed some days is hard and we get it, um, you know, but the good, the, the, the positive thing I want to mention is they actually don't get too much of the kidney disease or the neurologic disease. So we, they don't really get that scleroderma renal crisis. It's very, very rare, less than 5% in that recent in inceptions um, international cohort where we have about 200 patients. There was nobody with a scleroderma renal crisis over the past couple of years. Um, neurologic, they can get peripheral neuropathy, like the numbness and tingling when there's a lot of in inflammation and edema in the hands um, and with the joint contractures. But then 
Beyond that, there's typically not um, central nervous system neurological issues like stroke and things of that nature. Um, psychological and emotional, we definitely need to support these patients, get resources for them for school, you know, through foundations, et cetera. Um, so still, still working on that. Um, and just wanted to mention in the final you know, few minutes here about treatment approaches. Overall, our goal is to improve the quality of life and limit the progression of this disease. Whenever possible, we'd love to reverse that disease damage. It's not always possible, but we do our best to try. Um, in general, so you want to support the body, stay warm, use emollients, keep that skin nice and hydrated, do a healthy lifestyle, get some exercise every day, walking the dog, even if it's a block one day, and then the next week, two blocks, just keep going with some kind of activity every day. Well-balanced diet. Please, no special diet in children. They are growing. They need all the basic building blocks. Unless they have a specific food allergy or whatnot, just a general healthy diet, um, minus the Cheetos, of course, um, would be recommended. Um, and then just general um, support for the soul, any counseling, support groups, you know, such as the Scleroderma Research Foundation, et cetera, would be great. Um, definitely getting PT and OT involved early in the disease get the inflammation down and get that range of motion, you know, maximized as much as possible. And then medications, of course, are a main part of this as well. And the pediatric rheumatologist will walk you through that. Um, so these are just some of the measures to kind of protect the body, keep warm, decrease the Raynaud's as much as possible, you know, wear layers, a heated um, vest or jacket is great. Um, any of the Aquaphor, CeraVe, those kind of um, um topical creams. Um, Meta honey is nice if they're having the early digital ulcers that aren't, you know, necessarily open yet. Um, and avoid things that make Raynaud's worse, like caffeine or stimulants. Um, and then if the skin is really thick, sometimes antihistamines are helpful. I also want to mention the hidden reflux. We definitely mentioned we want to raise the head of the bed. That definitely ha helps a tremendous amount. Patients will notice in a few weeks that they're overall, they're getting more energy in the morning. They didn't realize that they were having those reflux symptoms. Um, try to eat the small frequent meals. If you're going to have a bigger meal, have it at noontime, not right before dinner, um, for, for bed. Um, try not to eat a good like three hours before you go to bed. Um, and then, you know, the typical supportive measures like antacids, uh, promotilities that I, uh, agents that I listed. And sometimes if they're having swallow issues, they'll need to thicken liquids. Um, in the essence of time, we are not going to go over all the rheumatology medications, but I just wanted to list some of them for you, such as the methotrexate, mycophenolate, um, nintenidib, which is OFEV, um, prednisone. In children, prednisone is okay, but they don't have that risk of a scleroderma renal crisis. Um, and injectables such as methotrexate, tocilizumab, or octemer, which was just FDA approved for the adults for interstitial lung disease, um, abetacept or Arencia. And then there's a kind of IV medicines like cytoxin or cyclophosphamide, rituximab, and IBIG. And then lots of other medicines that dilate the blood vessels, um, like sildenafil, et cetera, for um, Raynaud's and digital ulcers. And then in the last minute or two, I did want to mention stem cell transplant, but for patients with severe disease. So what this does is basically it immune resets the immune system. So you're going in with um, chemo kind of killing or annihilating all the cells that are kind of circulating the blood system and then pulling out from stimulating the bone marrow to get the baby cells to come out that haven't committed to doing any autoimmune bad things. And then you're kind of isolating those baby cells, freezing them down, and then you're giving the patient that high conditioning with radiation, chemotherapy, et cetera. Then you infuse their baby cells that were frozen and then you let those baby cells grow in this new environment that then kind of repopulate the immune system and hopefully get away of rid of those kind of bad um, T cell clones is what we're thinking that might be driving the autoimmune disease. So you're left with like the newer healthy T cells that can kind of repopulate in a healthy manner. So we have a um, stem cell transplant protocol here for pediatrics at Pittsburgh, and we've aligned specialists in cardiology, GI, bone marrow transplant, pulmonology, physical therapy, et cetera, to work as a team for these patients. Um, we're accepting patients eight and older. And I just want to mention that so far, five patients have undergone this. No major infection or safety concerns have um, come about. A lot of the patients feel like it's been life-changing. 
um, improvement on global outcome measures like their skin score, their quality of life measures. Um, many said that they could now ride a bike and they couldn't do that before. You know, there are lots of big life changes. Um, and the, the most recent patient is just a hundred, just over a hundred days out. So that's her in the corner. Um, but, you know, for the general patient, um, build your team. You know, your PCP is going to help you out the most with the rheumatologist. The rheumatologist might be the ringleader then that's getting all these specialists um, kind of involved. And don't forget physical and occupational therapy. Other things such as dentistry and wound care, et cetera, are also kind of part of the picture. Um, alternative medicine is also a potential, but run it by the rheumatologist first. And then these are the end of the take home points. This is an autoimmune disease. Um, it has lots of different manifestations, but please listen to some of the screening um, evaluations that I mentioned. Um, some patients come to our clinic without some of these things done, so I definitely encourage to kind of scan the whole organ bo body system to see what could be going on with these pediatric patients. And then we reviewed briefly some of the treatments, and obviously this is a um, kind of a decision that's made with the pediatric rheumatologist and the care team together. And then certain patients would be... Um, suitable for autologous stem cell transplant, but that needs to kind of be kind of streamlined through the rheumatologist. So thank you. Thank, thank you, the Scleroderma Research Foundation um, and Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, but most of all, my patients. Um, so these are just some pictures of my patients, and um, I appreciate your attention and time and look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Torok. That was a great presentation. My name is Deanne Wright, and I've been a board member of the Scleroderma Research Foundation since 1999. I'm also head of our research committee. Let's take a look at some of the questions our viewers have shared. And Dr. Torak, the first question is, does scleroderma affect children differently than adults? Thanks, Deanne. Um, excellent question. So in some of the slides, I did point out some of these similarities and differences. So the answer is yes and no. Um, so the organ systems affected are similar, such as um, pulmonary, GI, vascular with Raynaud's, et cetera, but the frequency is slightly different. Um, for example, for pulmonary arterial hypertension, even though it's uncommon in adults, um, maybe you know 5 to 15 percent, it's, it's much less common in children, maybe 5 percent or so. Um, while, while the interstitial lung disease, that's actually pretty similar. We had a recent international cohort study we found by doing chest CTs, in addition to the um, pulmonary function tests, found kids actually have 40% of them have interstitial lung disease, which is on par with the adult scleroderma population. Um, and some other similarities or differences is how kids present. Kids honestly just don't complain that much. So um, the rheumatologist has to do a little digging and, and kind of thoughtful thinking um, when asking questions um, such as um, GI. Um, about 75% of kids do have uh, gastrointestinal involvement, including esophageal dysmotility and gastric emptying problems. However, the child's not going to say, yes, I have heartburn or it hurts in my chest after I have spicy food or tomatoes. Um, that's just not what happens. What happens is they just eat less and less. Um, and you ask about, oh, how much does uh, Susie eat now at dinner? And then you kind of get more information. They're eating smaller and smaller amounts and getting full after eating a small amount of food. Then you ask about the pediatrician's um, visits and if their weight is kind of falling off the growth curve. And a lot of the times that will be happening. So um, there's a little bit more detective work, I would say, in pediatrics. Um, so, so there's some nuances, but overall, the organ systems affected are the same. So, some of the treatments, you know, end up being similar. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Another question is: um, when scleroderma is caught early in juvenile onset patients, is there a better chance to reduce severity of the disease? Another good question. Yes, in, in pediatric rheumatology, the sooner the patients that get to us, the better, whether it's um, systemic sclerosis or juvenile arthritis or pediatric lupus. Um, just because any of those conditions, the longer the immune system is um, kind of overriding and kind of attacking the organ systems, the longer you potentially have like the, the damage that can happen over time that becomes a little less reversible um, with our medicines, with our immunosuppression medicines like Celsept and methotrexate and steroids. Um, so the sooner patients can get to us, the better. The caveat 
is that juvenile systemic sclerosis is actually one of the most rare of the pediatric rheumatologic conditions. So it does take sometimes years to get to the pediatric rheumatologist. Um, in a recent study that I've done with my um, Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatology Research Alliance colleagues, um, we've seen, we surveyed um, patients in, internationally and more, more nationally, and they, um, the parents did say as far as access to care or delaying care, what the main problem was. It wasn't driving three hours to the pediatric rheumatologist. It was actually the primary care physician kind of alerting and thinking, oh, this might be a rheumatologic or scleroderma type condition. Um, so that's kind of the, the thing that we're working on to get patients to us sooner because that does make a difference, getting earlier to the rheumatologist. Um, and then we do treat a little more aggressively than adult rheumatologists. Uh, we do do a lot of combination uh, immunosuppression and kind of up, up, up front um, to kind of get the disease under control as soon as possible. Right, great, thank you. Um, does the disease always progress in the same way in all people, or do does each person have sort of their own path for their own disease? Yeah, so patients tend to kind of have their own path. Um, we definitely have things that help us, like autoantibody markers drawn from the blood, or surveillance things like the CT scan to see if people have interstitial lung disease. So the organ involvement and the skin thickening, the degree of skin thickening, help us kind of group patients into big picture groups. But even within that, um, sometimes patients um, kind of just get sick and that's just how, what their immune systems are doing. And sometimes other patients will respond very quickly um, to therapy. So unfortunately, we don't have that um, great prognostic biomarker um, in the very beginning of the disease, but that's why myself included and other researchers in the Scleroderma Research Foundation community um, are working on such biomarkers, like at the very onset in the skin and the blood, trying to classify where the patients are in the scleroderma kind of phenotype and where they might project or where they might go. So we're working on it, but we don't, we don't know as of yet. We just follow the patients very closely clinically. Thank you. Um, another question is, my child has improved on medication. How is this possible with a progressive disease? Yeah, this, this is also um, an, a nice question uh, for other parents listening, um, because uh, this is from one of my patients, I think, that um, is now four years out and um, in remission and doing well. And it's a different mindset from your very first visit to the rheumatologist when you're you're told your child has scleroderma and you Google scleroderma and you see all the things that potentially can happen. Um, however, as I mentioned, in Pease rheumatology, we really treat aggressively up, up front and do all these surveillance studies to help get to the point where we're years down the road and we're maybe on a few medications and not several medications. Um, can all the medications come off? Probably not, but we can definitely get patients down from five medications to maybe two medications. Um, Long-term, most scleroderma patients do need some kind of acid suppression or Raynaud's medicine to vasodilate, but there are times, there are patients of mine that we've been able to get off the immunosuppression like the Celsept or the methotrexate, but that's definitely individualized patient by patient. Oh, that's good news. So. Yeah. Um, another uh, person asked, my child is doing well on medication, and will they ever be able to stop? So I guess that's a little bit of the same question, but um, if you have anything else to add. Yeah, yeah, so so exactly, S similar question. Um, the, the only opposite is also, obviously disease can sometimes progress or pick up. So that's why even if your child is doing well and we start weaning medications, um, a regular follow-up with the pediatric rheumatologist is definitely essential because sometimes we need those medications, the disease will flare and we will need to restart or increase medication doses. So there's definitely patients that do well, go in remission and you can wean those medications down and almost off. Um, but there are some patients that will kind of flare if you're weaning those medications down. Um, and again, we're hoping that we can get somewhere with those prognostic biomarkers and figure out what patients that we could maybe wean medications off faster um, and what patients maybe won't do well if we take that cell sept away and we should just keep that on board. So hopefully in the next five years, I'll have 
more straightforward answers to the, the last uh, two questions. Well, thank you. I know you're working very hard on that and your research side as well. We're very, very fortunate to have you as a resource for all of the community and um, as such a great physician for juvenile patients. And so thank you very much. All right. Dr. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. So we've reached the end of our time. And um, for those watching, there is a brief survey about the presentation, which should be popping up on your screen now. And we'd love to get your feedback.